What is the difference between a particle and a wave in quantum physics? Particles and fields governed by quantum theory would behave near a black hole. Is the cat alive or dead? What is gravity and how does it work? Is the solar system stable? How do stars eventually run out of fuel and die? And what happens to a star that cannot support itself against its own gravity? What is a black hole and how is it formed? My work on black holes began with a eureka moment. This suggested that the area of a black hole was like what is called the entropy in thermodynamics. This is A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Particles like photons, or electrons, make up all matter. Scientists aim to measure them and examine their speed to learn more about the universe. However, when you try to analyze particles, they behave in a very peculiar way. Strangely, the more accurately you try to measure a particle's position, the less certain it is, and the more accurately you measure a particle's speed, the less certain the position is. The uncertainty principle is the term used to describe this phenomena, which was originally observed in the 1920s. Scientists had to employ other methods of observing particles due to the uncertainty principle. Therefore, they started focusing on a particle's quantum state. A particle's quantum state combines all of its likely potential locations and speeds. Since it is impossible to determine a particle's precise position, or speed, scientists consider all of the possible positions and speeds that a particle could have. The likelihood of each potential location, where a particle, might be as calculated as it moves around. To help them determine this, scientists treat particles as if they are waves. Because, a particle can be in so many various places, they seem to be, a continuous succession of oscillating waves. Imagine a string that is pulsating. The string will arc and dip through peaks and troughs as it vibrates. A particle also behaves like this, although its possible path is a series of such overlapping waves, all happening at once. By examining particles in this way, researchers can determine the particle's most likely location. The arcs and dips on the various waves must coincide for the particle to be in one of its most likely places, and they must not coincide for it to be in one of its least likely positions. This is called interference, and it shows which positions and speeds are most probable for the particle wave's path. around you, you are perceiving the world in three dimensions, which allows you to categorize every object based on its height, width, and depth. Although we cannot see it, there is a fourth dimension that joins the other three to form space-time, which we refer to as time. This four-dimensional space-time model is used by scientists to explain cosmic phenomena. An event is something that takes place at a specific time and place in space. Therefore, in addition to the three-dimensional coordinates, a fourth coordinate representing time is included when calculating an event's position. Scientists have to take time into consideration when determining the position of an event because the theory of relativity states that time is relative. It is therefore an important factor in describing the nature of an event. An amazing consequence of the combination of space and time is how it changed our conception of gravity. 
Massive things bend space-time, causing gravity. A massive body, like the sun, can literally bend space-time. Consider it like this. Think of space-time as a blanket that is held in the air and being spread out. The blanket will curl and the object will slightly sink if you place it in the center of the blanket. Massive things alter space-time in ways similar to this. Then, other objects travel along these space-time curves. This is due to the fact that an object will always choose the route that will carry it from point A to point B, which is a circular orbit around a larger object. If you take another look at that blanket, you will notice this. A smaller marble, for example, will follow the larger marble's indentation if you place it in the center of the blanket and then try to roll a smaller one past it. The same principles apply to gravity. Stars require vast amounts of energy to generate heat and light throughout their lifetimes. However, this energy eventually exhausts itself, causing the star to die. Depending on its size, a star's death has different effects. A black hole is produced when a very massive star exhausts all of its energy. The gravitational field of the majority of big stars is so intense that it creates black holes. The star can use its energy to prevent collapse while it is still alive. But when a star runs out of fuel, it is unable to defy gravity and its deteriorating body collapses in on itself. Everything is pulled inwards toward an infinitely dense, spherical point called a singularity. This singularity is the black hole. When a black hole forms, space-time is curved so steeply by its gravity that even light bends along it. In addition to devouring everything in its vicinity, black holes also create a point of no return, across which nothing can pass. Even light, which travels faster than anything else in the universe, cannot cross this point, which is called the event horizon. This raises a question, if a black hole absorbs light and anything else that crosses its event horizon, how can we know they are there? Scientists search for black holes by looking for their gravitational effect on the universe and for the X-rays produced by their interaction with orbiting stars. For example, scientists look for stars orbiting dark and massive objects that could be black holes. They also look for the X-rays and other waves that are commonly produced by matter when it is being sucked in and torn up by a black hole. There is even a source of radio and infrared waves at the center of our galaxy that could be a supermassive black hole. If the gravitational pull of a black hole is so strong that not even light can escape it, then you'd think nothing else could escape either. But you'd be wrong. In fact, black holes must release something. Otherwise, they'd break the second law of thermodynamics. According to the second universal law of thermodynamics, entropy, the tendency towards increased disorder, always increases. And as entropy increases, temperature must also rise. An example of this is how a fire poker shines red hot and emits radiation as heat after being in a fire. Since black holes absorb disordered energy from the universe in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy of the black hole should also increase. In addition, as a result of this increase in entropy, black holes should have to let heat escape. Although, nothing that has passed a black hole's event horizon can escape, virtual pairs of particles and antiparticles near the event horizon can serve the second law of thermodynamics, 
allowing for the escape of heat. Virtual particles are particles whose effects can be measured, but which cannot be detected. One of the companions has positive energy, while the other has negative energy. In a black hole, gravitation is so powerful that it can pull the negative particle into the black hole, releasing enough energy for the positive particle's partner to potentially escape into the universe and emit heat. Thus, the black hole is able to emit radiation in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. Negative particles being sucked into the black hole are equal to the quantity of positive radiation emitted. The inward flow of negative particles can reduce the mass of the black hole until it evaporates and dies. And if its mass is sufficiently reduced, the black hole will likely end in a final explosion as powerful as millions of hydrogen bombs. Black holes have gripped the imagination of a young generation of theorists like these at Cambridge University. As ideas are stretched to the limit, the acknowledged leader in black hole theory is Stephen Hawking. He and another British theorist, Roger Penrose, laid down the basic principles ten years ago. They said the black hole would possess at its centre an even stranger object. All the matter of a star collapsed to a geometric point. A singularity where gravity crushes particles out of existence. Oh, you would like me to draw a cylinder on the board, fine. A grave physical handicap makes Stephen Hawking's work all the more remarkable. For 13 years since his student days, he's fought a wasting disease of nerve and muscle. When his wife Jane married him, he wasn't expected to live very long. Now they've two children, Lucy and Robert. No self-pity for Hawking. With a physical handicap, he says, you can't afford any psychological ones. And although the gentle gravity of the planet Earth confines him to a wheelchair, in his mind, he masters the overwhelming gravity of a black hole. The Big Bang is like a black hole explosion, but on a much larger scale. By finding out how a black hole creates matter, we may discover how the Big Bang created all the matter in the universe. The singularity of the Big Bang seems to be a, a frontier beyond which we cannot go. Yet we can't help asking what lies beyond the Big Bang. Why does the universe exist at all? My son Robert is always asking questions. Why this? Why that? Every child does. It's what raises us from being cavemen. On one view, we are just weak, feeble creatures at the mercy of the forces of nature. When we discover the laws which govern these forces, we rise above them and become masters of the universe. <laughs> 